Professor Compton is originally from the San Francisco Bay area where he received his bachelor's degree from the University of California at San Diego in 1981 and his PhD from Harvard University in 1986. He taught at the School of Marine Science, University of South Florida before moving to the Department of Geological Sciences at UCT in 1996. While at UCT, he taught a first year introductory course on earth and environmental sciences. And in collaboration with students and colleagues, he has published over 60 papers spanning a wide range of research topics that include the origin of offshore phosphorus rich deposits, wind blown dust as a source of nutrients to the highly diverse Fainbos plant ecosystem, as well as on topics integrating geology and human evolution. He is now Emeritus Professor and he continues to work on various research projects as, as well as publishing books on natural history. Over to you, John. Yes, good, af good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to be with you all uh, wherever you are. Uh, and I uh, enjoy lecturing at summer school and winter school in the past. This is my first time on Teams, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, but what I uh, hope to do in this course uh, over the next five days is kind of share with you some of the experiences and pleasures I've had in exploring the natural wonders of the West Coast. Uh, I've been here uh, for over 25 years now, and most of that time my research has focused on the West Coast uh, from Cape Town area north as far as southern Namibia. So we're going to cover a number of different areas along the West Coast to explore. And I think particularly now in this time of COVID and the restrictions in terms of being able to move around, uh, it's extremely useful to look into local travel, to small trips. And so my hope is that by introducing you to a number of the sites and places that you can visit and see, that'll encourage you and entice you to hit the road and do a day excursion or take a weekend trip and explore some of the amazing areas that the West Coast has to offer. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I am always amazed when I speak with people in Cape Town how many uh, claim that they've never been to the West Coast Fossil Park or to points north on the West Coast. So again, I hope that this will open your eyes and get you interested in taking those trips. Um, and we're going to start this first lecture out of five is really going to be about defining the West Coast and also looking at the area in terms of the major themes. And then what I'm going to do in the subsequent lectures is do a series of sort of travel logs in which we will journey to different parts of the West Coast. And I will try to give you as realistically as possible a visual uh, tour of those areas for you to see what they're about. So in this image, we have all of Southern Africa. This is a composite photo from NASA taken from satellite. And it shows you uh, in the box there on the, on the left, the region of the West Coast in general. Everyone, I suppose, has their own definition of the West Coast and what it means to them. Um, and in general, it extends from Cape Agulhas uh, all the way up along the West Coast as far as uh, Namibia. And some would even extend it up all the way through Namibia to Angola. And for me, I extended inland to the Cape Full Belt Mountains, to the Cedarburg, or to the Great Escarpment. And I think the amazing thing about the West Coast is its diversity of landscapes, uh, its diversity of rocks. And one of the main themes I want to address in this um, initial talk is about the power of the place, that, that every place has certain powers that are given to it through 
uh, aspects about it, such as the bedrock geology, which goes in part to define the types of landscapes that we see. And also um, the bedrock, of course, weathers to form soils that give rise to specific vegetation types. So for each of us, we each have our own personal uh, sense of place um, from every aspect that we take in from our senses in terms of how we define what that place means to us. And I think the West Coast, um, for me, engenders a lot of different aspects, and I hope to share those with you. Some may overlap with aspects that you have also identified in your own travels, and maybe some that are new. So the sort of plan is, just to show you where we'll be going, if you look at the uh, figure on the left there from Cape Town, uh, in the second lecture, I'm going to be speaking of taking a trip from Cape Town up to Easterfontein. It's really only about an hour or a little bit more than an hour's drive up the West Coast. And we'll be looking at aspects of the Milnerton Lagoon, uh, the Bloberg Strand, Kuberg, uh, Kwatu, the San Cultural Heritage Center, and then on to Easterfontein, and we'll talk about aspects of Darling and Mamre as well. Then in lecture three, we're going to go a bit further north and talk about the West Coast National Park, shown here with the um, large circle here, uh, include Longabon Lagoon. Um, and then north of that is the West Coast Fossil Park, uh, which I'll also include within lecture three. And then lecture four, we're going to journey further up the West Coast to Forlorn Play, uh, the Oliphant's River Mouth, Von Rhine's uh, Pass, Springbok, the Orange River Mouth, I Ice, and Luderitz. So that'll be extending uh, quite a bit further to the north. And then we're going to conclude on Friday in lecture five in a road trip from Cape Town, following this red line shown here, past Parl, through Wellington, through Baines Cliff Pass, into the Tolbach Worcester Valley, taking Mitchell's Pass up into Ceres Basin, and taking a jaunt over to the Haido Pass to the north, and then carrying on out through the Karua Port into the Tonkwa Karoo. And the point of this fifth lecture, this journey, is to show you the entire Cape supergroup geology through that. Yeah, that's his process. mute, Peter Leinberger, guest yeah, mute. Um, beautifully exposed. Let's try it. No, that's not going off. So the first main theme I want to discuss is how the landforms relate to the geology. And what we see in this image is a combination of the topography uh, shown in colors from green to orange to white on land. And then at sea, it shows you what's called the bathymetry, which is what the seabed would look like if you were to have drained, if you were to drain the ocean. Okay. And um. from this image, we can see, for example, the Cape Fold Belt, which extends from the north as the Cedarburg Mountains down into Texas and then carries on to the east as far as Puerto Rico. Very faint. Okay. Um, and we can see that these structures, these major mountain structures in here, are made up of the resistant quartz sandstone rocks of the Cape Supergroup. The low lying areas, these areas shown in green, the coastal plain, these are made up of your um, basement rocks of Malmesbury Shale, and where you see these wrinkling hills like the Darling Hills shown here, or the Malmesbury Hills shown here, these are underlain by granite. So we have the Malmesbury Shale and the granite on the coastal plain, and then further offshore, we have features such as the Cape Canyon, this very amazing incision into the shelf. We have a funny little dimple depression on the shelf, 
that may be the result of gas escape from sediments deep below or could be from a meteorite impact in the past. That has yet to be investigated. And we have um, these rougher, rockier inner shelf area shown here. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that we're all familiar with tidal movements of the sea, low to high tide, but over longer geological timescales of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of years, what, ha what has happened is sea level has fluctuated. And where you see this white line drawn here offshore, that represents the depth to which um, the sea would drop if it were to fall by 130 meters. And that's what it did during the glacial maxima. Okay, these would be the periods when the large northern hemisphere ice sheets built up to thicknesses of three, four kilometers. And that water to make the ice was extracted from the sea and it resulted in global sea level falling by 130 meters. And the case of the Cape that shows up here as this expansion of the land towards the offshore sea. And you can see, particularly in the southern regions here off of Cape Agullas, you can see how much larger the area was in which um, the land was exposed, such that just 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, the Breeder River would have flowed all the way out here, down to here to enter the sea. False Bay Valley would have, uh, Bay would have been a valley, totally exposed. Robin Island, a funny flat topped hill, etc. And you can in fact see that in the bathymetry, see how this is all rough and rocky in the inner part here. And that's because what has happened over the glacial and the glacial cycles is the sea has come in and out, in and out uh, so many times. And what that's done is tended to prevent sediment from covering up those rocky bedrock features. Now the blue line uh, shown here is the plus 25 meters. And this is how high sea level would have come during previous interglacials and during the early Pliocene before you had major Northern Hemisphere glaciation. So in that case, um, the Cape Peninsula becomes two offshore islands separated by a shallow sea in between. Cape Columbine also, Postburg becomes an island with a shallow sea separating. So it's important, I think, to remember too that the, um, what we think of as the land today has changed in the past and relates to these fluctuations in sea level. The other, uh, another key theme that I want to address is the fact that the vegetation relates to the bedrock geology. And this sort of should make sense because rocks have to weather to give rise to the soil. And if you have very different rocks, they're going to give rise to very different soils. And those plants have to then adapt to those soils. So in this image, uh, this is another satellite image showing you um, the area from uh, Cape Columbine, here's Saldana Bay, Longamon Lagoon. Here's the Picketburg, this dark triangular feature here. And in the far right, we have the Cape Fold Belt Cedarburg Mountains. And what you'll notice on here is the mountain sandstone vein box, which is typical of Table Mountain, for example, dominates in the Cedarburg and it dominates in the Picketburg. And that's because the mountain sandstone fein boss plants are adapted to very shallow, quartz-rich soils, acidic soils. If we go adjacent to these in the lowland areas, like the Swartland, in between the Picketburg and Cedarburg, in the, we have what's called the shell Renosterfelt vegetation biome, and that has, as you can see from this image, been essentially obliterated by farming. So all this patch quilt pattern that you see here is reflective of all of the plowed fields 
that have been um, developed through farming to grow winter wheat and other crops. If we go closer to the coast, we have sand covering, and this is where the lowland sand faint boss biome grows, quite distinct from the Swartland shale Renoster felt. And we have a dune strand felt near the active dune areas. We have salt marsh within the Longaban Lagoon. And we have limestone strand felt and granite strand felt that grow separately on the granite and calcrete limestone substrates, respectively. So that's one of the main amazing themes that I find in the West Coast is that the landforms are largely determined by the underlying geology, as is the vegetation type that grows on it. And I think you can appreciate from this image that you can believe that it's true that we have altered 75% of land, uh, non-ice covered land, and that that alteration has primarily been through the act of farming. So obviously farming is very important for growing enough food to feed everyone. And you can see the huge number of farms just within the West Coast area alone uh, for growing crops. And this is a, just a photo to show you the Picketburg viewed from the Pekingese Cliff Pass on the N7. And it's in springtime. So you can see the wheat growing in the fields in the Swartland below, and then the rocky um, Picketburg where you don't, you can't grow crops because it's too steep and the soil is not nearly as good. And the mountain sandstone fame boss uh, is familiar to many of us who hike on Table Mountain with the characteristic proteas, the restios, reed-like restios, the ericas, the heathers, and the geophytes, the lilies, and so forth. So very distinctive vegetation type, and it is adapted to these very resistant quartz sandstone rocks, which we see here exposed in Tidal Cliff Gorge as the quartz, nearly pure quartz sandstone rock. Now, interestingly, within gullies and, and uh, major ravines, we get the Afromontane forest. And that's quite a distinct uh, biome that is restricted in large part to these deep ravines, uh, perhaps because they're protected from fire uh, and wind and have more moisture brought in from the rivers that flow through them. And then a real uh, jewel in the West Coast is, of course, the West Coast National Park. This is an aerial photograph taken looking north. So you can see the beautiful lagoon. Uh, and you can see in the distance, Saldana Bay. And then on the left hand side is the Atlantic Ocean. And here are the active dune systems in white fringing the coast at 16 mile beach. So Longabon Lagoon is, has some great examples of different uh, beautiful environments. This is the salt marsh system shown on the right, a real rich carpet of what we call halophytic vegetation because it's adapted to high salt conditions. In the distance, you can see the Hillbeck Visitor Center. I've shown it here, this little circle. This is an aerial photo taken of the same region showing you the southern extent of Longamon Lagoon. And then this would be an area of extensive salt marsh vegetation. So fully one third of South Africa's salt marsh is actually in Longabon Lagoon. So it's a major feature. The other major feature of the area is mobile sand in the form of active mobile moving dune sand. So on the far left here, here again is Saldana Bay with the lagoon. And you can see adjacent to it, you have this plume of sand moving from Aesterfontein Beach to the north. And this is a diagram in the middle to show you that little clear with Longabon Lagoon here. And here is this plume of sand, much of it vegetated, so it doesn't look like white sand, but 
portions of it are not vegetated, like the Heelbeck dune field. Here's a photograph of that dune field, and you can see very clearly the large dune structures moving. And German scientists have clocked those dunes as moving up to five to 10 meters per year. And that's under the influence of our very strong southeaster wind. And this shows you for scale, these are people within a trough of one of these dune systems, and they find interesting archaeological remains in those troughs. And of course, human evolution happened in Africa, and one of the key aspects that we'll also touch upon is evidence for that human evolution on the West Coast. So at Elon's Bay, here's Fluorin Flay, and here's Elon's Bay. There's Elon's Bay Cave, which dates back to 22,000 years ago with human artifacts. And then Deep Cliff, Deep Cliff Rock Shelter, overlooking Forlorn Play, has a record going back beyond 65,000 years where we find these amazing ostrich eggshell fragments that have been engraved with these different patterns. And they're similar to the famous piece of ochre that was found on the south coast at Blombos Cave with these markings uh, on it as well, these engravings. And they're also very finely made stone tools. Then if we go to Long, back to Longabon Lagoon, this is Crawl Bay, a po popular picnic site. And what you see at Crawl Bay, this is Crawl Bay in the foreground, this is the creek stool. Um, and these are the Postburg granite hills in the distance. And what we find here are a rock that's called Aeolianite, which is a stack of light colored rocks here, which are essentially um, solidified dune deposits. And on some of those dune deposits, right about there, they have found human footprints, amazingly enough, human footprints preserved within the dune sand. And those are dated to around 120,000 years ago. So we don't have a lot of fossil evidence for humans on the West Coast at that time, but we do have these trace fossils of their footprints. And this is a photo up here in the upper right showing you what are probably maybe hyena footprints, not quite clear, but those are still exposed and you can see those when you visit at that site. So, of course, humans evolved in Africa and we became clever using symbolic uh, representations like the engravings and we made very nice stone tools. And of course, eventually we spread throughout the world and people came back to Africa from Europe and they brought the Industrial Revolution. And so one of the key features we'll be looking at in this series on the West Coast is how humans have impacted the West Coast. And that's sometimes now referred to as the Anthropocene, which is simply means the human epic. So in line with other geological epics like the Miocene and the Neogene and so forth, um, it has been proposed that humans in their activities have become a force in their own right a uh, major force that has altered the earth. And one of the key ways that we've altered the earth is of course in the atmospheric composition by increasing the level of CO2 as a trace gas, but a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And you can see from this plot showing you the pre-industrial level it was down here at about 280 parts per million. It then started to increase rapidly and then caught up exponentially to levels of around 418 parts per million today. And it's expected to double within the next uh, decade or two. And so that is the main concern around global warming, that CO2 will trap enough heat in the atmosphere to increase global temperatures by maybe as much as five degrees by the end of the century if we do not change our ways. And there has been a lot of discussion about when to define the start of the Anthropocene. Do we make it the start of the Industrial Revolution? Do we make it the first atomic nuclear test? And others uh, marking points have been proposed. 
But for me, the real aspect of the Anthropocene that we need to think about is when it might end, right? Because that was, that's the day we all don't, don't want to come, is when the Anthropocene might end and that, that humans will have done something so disastrous to have end, ended the Anthropocene, Anthropocene um, epic. Now, we know from the West Coast fossil record that change on the West Coast is nothing new. I suppose what you could say is that since the Industrial Revolution, change has been extremely rapid, uh, but certainly there's been major changes on the West Coast uh, long before humans had even evolved. And one place that shows this quite beautifully, another real jewel on the West Coast, is the West Coast National Park. Oh, sorry, the West Coast Fossil Park. And the Fossil Park is, it's not far, just north of the National Park and inland of it. And what it consists of is an old phosphate mine, the Chemphos mine, that mine phosphate there. And they have garnered um, lottery funds to build a beautiful exhibition hall and amphitheater. And in the distance here, you can see the tent under which this amazing fossil bone bed exists that has been excavated very painstakingly with dental tools and brushes. And what's beautiful about this exposure is they've left the bones as they came to rest five million years ago. So you as the viewer get to witness how all the bones are distributed and arranged. And they're an amazing mixture of large animal bones. There's a whale vertebra, there's jaw bones with teeth you can see there. And that jaw bone with teeth is of the, what was called the short necked giraffe, known as the civetheer. And this is a wood sculpture within the new exhibition hall showing you what that looked like. And they were large animals. And there were also elephants, unusual elephants that are extinct today, as is the civetheer, of course, no longer exists. There was also Africa's only known bear existed at that time, as well as saber-toothed cats and other animals which have become extinct. So if you look at the fossil record on the West Coast, certainly in the last 5 million years through to today, you can see a whole turnover of animals, some of them becoming extinct, other ones evolving um, and taking their place or, or changing through time. And so, as I mentioned, change is nothing new, but what is perhaps particularly worrisome about humans and their impact is just how quickly things have changed. And many of us would realize that from the last even decade or two, certainly since I've lived here, the changes that have taken place uh, in and around Cape Town. So one of the aspects, of course, is hunting. And we know that our ancestors, of course, hunted. Here's the image of a rock art from the Sevilla Rock Art Trail um, in Travelers Rest, showing the bow and arrow. And even when Europeans came equipped with horses and rifles, they still struggled to hunt. And this is because African animals having evolved alongside humans had learned to be very wary of them and to avoid them whenever possible. But hunt they did. And unfortunately, the Huaca shown here in the middle and the blue antelope uh, more on the south coast and the, and the west coast at that time, both of those uh, became extinct. But fortunately, some animals were saved, um, and among them was the bontibok, shown here in the lower middle. And the bontibok was saved by farmers who took the interest and made the effort to ensure that small populations survived. And other animals such as the Cape Leopard have managed to survive as well, primarily because they're able to survive in very remote, very rugged areas of the Cape Fold Belt and the Cedarburg Mountains and so forth. 
So many of the animals that Africa is so famous for managed to barely survive, at least somewhere. And what this has allowed is for reintroducing those animals to parks such as the West Coast National Park, which has Elon, and help restore some of the animals that have since locally become extinct, but still exist elsewhere. So the other impact, of course, would be through urbanization. This is a photo taken from Devil's Peak showing you the city bowl and the, and down and the central business district and the harbor. And one of the advantages to urbanization is that it focuses humans in a very tight area, which does allow for, hopefully, the preservation of areas in the country to preserve. And if we look specifically, we can see how dramatic those changes have been. On the far left is the map of Table Bay and city of Cape Town in 1801 from Barrow's book. And if we look at the more recent satellite images, we can see what's happened in the middle here. Here is the original shoreline in this white bar. And we can see that the southern end of Table Bay has been infill to form the foreshore. And part of that infill came from dredging at Reed Flay. So Reed Flay is sort of an artificial lake developed through dredging to fill in the southern foreshore. And we will, um, in the second lecture, we'll be going and visiting the Deep River Mouth uh, and some of the areas uh, north of here to show you what's been happening um, along that west coast. And we know, of course, as I mentioned before, that sea level has fluctuated from highs of about 25 meters, shown here on the far left, to minus 130 meters, uh, shown here in the middle. And on the right, this plot shows you what that's related to through time. So 120,000 years ago was the last interglacial. Sea level was close to or a bit higher than today. It has steadily dropped to the glacial maximum. 20,000 years ago. That's when False Bay was exposed as a valley and the shoreline was far offshore. Then the glacial maximum came to an end for reasons we don't entirely understand. And temperature, global mean temperature increased by five degrees to our current interglacial. Now you'll remember I said with global warming, the anticipation is a further warming of five degrees in terms of the mean global temperature. So from the rock, from the past records, we know what happens when temperatures fall five degrees from today, you go into a glacial. And we know what happens when temperature goes up five degrees. When you're in a glacial, you go back to another interglacial. What we don't know is what's going to happen if we raise temperature another five degrees today during the interglacial to become even warmer. So that's, that's the difficulty. We don't have good records of what that world situation would look like. But one of the worries, of course, is that sea level will rise because as you warm the atmosphere and you warm the ocean, then the ocean expands and it rises. And also, of course, you have ice melt. And ice melt raises the sea level and that causes inundation on the coast and coastal erosion. So this on the left shows you the plot showing you the, rise, the measured rise in sea level for over the last 100 years uh, from tide gauge data in blue and then satellite in orange. And sea level has steadily been rising currently at about 3.3 millimeters per year, which may not sound like much, but if you add that year after year, combine that with storm surge, it can become quite worrisome. And this shows you a scenario where if a sea level were to rise with four degrees C of warming, how it would flood through the Salt River, Black River, and into the Elsie Squall River uh, areas. Uh, and fortunately, Cape Town is largely above, fairly high above sea level, but certain areas, certainly at lower elevations, would be impacted. The other big issue, of course, in Cape Town is water. And wa water is, is difficult because we live in a very seasonal rainfall area 
where most of our rain arrives in the winter and most of it arrives at higher elevations um, in the mountains. And as we go north, it gets drier and drier, as many of us are familiar with as you go north. So this means, this makes us a very water stressed environment. And what we try to do is capture most of that winter rainfall in dams to get us through the next summer. But if we have a series of low rainfall years, if we have a drought, we can be in trouble as we were recently. And many of us would have lived through that. So if we look, this is a bit of a busy diagram, but if you look at the lower plot first, this red line shows you the three year mean of rainfall through the last hundred and some odd years. And what you'll notice is periodically uh, we get a drought. And the most recent one at the end here is blown up for you in the top diagram, where here we show in red the rainfall record. And you can see we had one, two, three years of unusually low rainfall. And this led to a progressive depletion of the dams as shown here in blue. And this was really getting towards bad situation in 2018. Fortunately, of course, the rain has picked up and the dams are all now full. So the crisis has been averted, but had the <clears throat> low rainfall persisted for another year or two, we would have been in real trouble. And one of the options for looking for water to help make up for the loss of uh, lack of rainfall is to take water stored in rocks. So what happens when it rains, particularly in the, say, the Cedarburg Mountains, is a certain amount of the water will percolate through the cracks in the rock and flow through the rock slowly through the rock and eventually it will flow out into rivers into the sea. But in the meantime, it forms what we call an aquifer, which is a large body of rock that has water in it. And you can put a borehole like they do in citrus fall, and you can pump out water in the summer to irrigate your crops. The problem with this is that a lot of the natural ecosystems rely on natural springs the natural springs would be the baths, for example, in the Citrus uh, Oliphant River Valley, where the water runs up against the fault and naturally comes to the surface as hot water. But if you overdraw in the boreholes, then you will deplete the aquifer and those natural springs may stop flowing. So you have to, has to be careful how you extract it. Now, a more recent and I think kind of exciting proposal is that we collect water from ice. And approximately 70% of Earth's fresh water is stored as ice. And most of that, of course, is on Antarctica. And here's a satellite image showing you Antarctica, which is, of course, covered by a huge ice cube that's three to four kilometers thick. And that's where the bulk of the Earth's fresh water is stored, because of course, snow is evaporated pure water from the ocean and doesn't have salt in it. Now the ice uh, bergs break off of here and they flow around the circumantarctic current. So one of the proposals is we go out to sea, we lasso a large tabular iceberg like this one in the lower left, and we wrap it in what's called a geotextile skirt. And then we hook it up to major tankers and tugboats. And we essentially haul this one kilometer by half a kilometer size hunk of ice. And we haul it up into salt, offshore Saldana Bay, into that canyon I mentioned earlier. And we melt it and extract the water and dump it on to land. It's never been tried before, but they have looked into the feasibility of doing it. And apparently it's cheaper to do this than to use desalinization, which is quite expensive. And the other key advantage to hauling an iceberg is it's a one-off event, or it can be a one-off event. So when we are desperate and absolutely in need of water, it is an option, I think, to be considered. The other theme about the uh, human impacts 
as I mentioned before, a lot of the plant biomes have been severely impacted, particularly those in low-lying areas. So this shows you in the, in the far left here, this shows you in the Cape Town area, the plant biomes that used to exist. And on the Cape Peninsula, we had the Table Mountain uh, sandstone fame moss, as I mentioned before. Here, these along the coast are the dune strandfeld, and we had the granite strandfeld, and we have the rhinosterfeld. And what you can see in the middle plot is that most of these low-lying areas where we live and where we farm have not surprisingly been essentially obliterated. Um, but there are little fragments and bits and pieces that have managed for various reasons to survive. And the idea is to try to con conserve and preserve what still remains that hasn't yet you know, been, hasn't become extinct. And one idea with that is these conservation corridors where you try to hook up all these fragments and you try to facilitate movement of the plants and animals through these corridors to enable and enhance uh, their survival. Um, there are so many barriers between roads and houses and other different types of human constructions that prevent these things from happening. But one idea is to try to facilitate that. And there have been farm organization, conservation organizations who've collaborated and made an effort to get these corridors established and to benefit the farms through natural populations of insects for pollination and so forth. A local example in Cape Town would be the transformation of Takai Forest to the lowland um, sand fame boss. So what you see here in the distance is the uh, monospecific single species of pine that's grown uh, as a pine plantation. And in the foreground where that's been replaced now uh, with the fame balls. And of course, there you have hundreds of different species of plants, many of which are endangered as the lowland fame boss is distinct from the mountain sandstone fame boss and is under greater threat. So I think it makes sense to try to re wild or reestablish these indigenous vegetation systems uh, to assist the preservation of those unique ecosystems. And, you know, finally, the point about uh, the current situation is often referred to as the human ecology because humans are so abundant and so active. And the need for us as humans to really adapt to this new world. And I use this image as sort of a way to picture how this might work. And this is in the Darling Hills, which are granite hills. You can see the large one here in the distance. And you can see, just make out, I think, these outcrops of granite. And those outcrops of granite meant that farmers couldn't plow this top part of the hill and it has remained relatively pristine and you have the original vegetation on top. And then in the foreground, this low area full of flowers is a nature reserve, the Tenny Fersfeld Reserve. And that has been set aside and you can see the beautiful diversity of floral plants growing there. And in between these two bits of conserved ground are, of course, the farms. And this shows an active farm here with canola and other crops being grown on the slopes of the granite hills. So we have to, of course, grow food. We have to eat. But there are ways of growing food more intensely and more um, effectively and allowing for farmers to dedicate parts of their farms towards reserves that are not plowed, in which the indigenous plants are given a chance to reestablish, and that are hopefully connected through these corridors so that they can better be conserved. Okay, that sort of basically ends the first lecture. I just wanna mention uh, that I, 
this lecture th series is largely around the publication of this latest book of mine, The West Coast and Natural History. It's uh, just been published and uh, is available. And my other two previous books, uh, Human Origins, How Diet, Climate, and Landscape Shaped Us, and The Rocks and Mountains of Cape Town are both also available. And if you're interested in learning more about these books, you're welcome to visit my website, johnscompton.com. And on there, you'll find information about all three books. And if you're interested in getting a copy for yourself or someone else, you can download the order form, which looks like this. And it's a fillable PDF. So you just type in the various boxes, your information, and then basically just email that back to me and I'll get the books to you. And um, you're welcome to email me at this address, john.compton at uct.ac.za if you have any questions or have any problems with figuring out how to do the order form. And so I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow at this time. And we're gonna start in on lecture two, which is gonna be the trip there shown in red where we're gonna go from Cape Town to Easterfontein and look at some of the sites along the way and see what's available to explore. So thanks very much. And I'm uh, looking forward, if anyone has any questions, uh, please raise your hand and I'll try to answer them. Hello, it's Patty here. I just want to know, you mentioned salt pans. Do we still have salt pans now? Yes, we most certainly do. And I will speak about those more specifically in the lectures that will be coming. Thank but you. I'll just say that locally, you might be familiar with the, for example, the Easterfontein salt pan. It's no longer, well, technically really active. It's actually mined. It was mined for salt early on and is now mined for gypsum, which is a calcium sulfate salt that's um, used in farming potatoes. And there are also a series of salt pans in and amongst the Darling Hills. And some of my students and I have looked at those um, salt pans there, and I'll mention those. And then, of course, as you go further north, you get more uh, salt pans along certainly the Namibian coast, where it's very arid. Well, thank you, John. We look forward to your lecture tomorrow.